Uh, I do want to spend some time because this is uh, a show that gets categorized as a careers one um, and how you found yourself in this role with the clock tower group. Um, you're very candid in the book about how you kind of had, we're going down the conventional PhD professorship type of track and then have taken all sorts of different diversions. Um, I, I wanted to start basically just talking about your time at Stratford and uh, explaining for a little bit uh, people what, Strapper is, was, and um, how you kind of found yourself there. Yeah, so Stratfor, uh is in the political risk um, industry, uh, just like Eurasia Group as well, um, and uh, some of the other firms in that space, um, like Geoquant, Ergo. Um, there's, a, there's a whole industry of political risk analysis. And I was doing my PhD at University of Texas, which is in Austin, and Stratford was headquartered in Austin as well. Um, and so when I got disillusioned with academia and said, well, I should probably learn how to, you know, I should probably have a real job at some point before I decide to go into uh, academia. It was just obvious. It just made a lot of sense. And so I joined it. This industry is not that big. You know, that's what's interesting about it. It's, uh, it's actually really small. And so, you know, getting a foothold in, in the kind of a political risk space is much more difficult than people think. And so um, it doesn't really exist as a profession. And so I was very fortunate to be able to, you know, spend some time at Stratfor and, and learn some of the ins and outs of how one actually, you know, uh, does political risk analysis. And uh, what I found while I was there was that it was kind of useful for a lot of CEOs and a lot of corporates uh, as a background, but I didn't feel like it was really, um, you know, it was nice to have, not a need to have the political kind of analysis that we were doing. And I felt that there was a way to do it in a way where it could actually generate alpha, that's the name of the book, which is returns above a certain benchmark in finance. I felt that there was actually a way to use political analysis to beat the markets in certain, you know, cases. And so that's why I decided to cross over more specifically into finance. But I definitely get a lot of questions all the time from people on LinkedIn or from young people studying international relations and political science. Like, hey, how do you actually enter this industry? And yeah, when you mentioned it being such a small world, I, I didn't even quite realize it when I first um, saw one of your interviews on Real Vision, but you know the Strat Four. That's where Peter Zions come out of. George Friedman. Um, th th it seems like an exceptionally uh, small circle of characters that um, you know have the ears of those decision makers and have done the work to kind of prove that they can make a call. Uh, you can have some confidence in it. Know that it's it's well researched. Um, one of the other parts that was interesting to me in, in the intro was. Um, I believe it was your uh, partner there at the Clock Tower Group, Stephen, who said that you were this nihilist. You had this nihilist approach to analysis. Um, and in different interviews, we've kind of talked about that in, in, in a different context, not in geopolitics, as potentially being uh, harmful. But can you talk about how a general nihilism about geopolitical analysis has behooved you um, in this profession? Yeah, and I think that's the, if, I, if there's one thing that I would take from the book and proselytize. It's that we need more nihilists. Now, not in your behavior as a human being, but in your profession. Why? Well, even if you're running an NGO that's trying to fundamentally change the world, you can't be blind to the constraints that face you. You know, and in fact, I think the way to be successful in any endeavor that has to do with the real world, which is messy and doesn't obey Newtonian physics, and so you can't just, you know, outsmart it through math. So whenever you're dealing with societies or humans, I think it's really uh, important to separate the analysis from your action and agency. And so uh, I talk a lot about this. I call it aloof indifference. My partner, Steve, calls it nihilism. And I mean, I do too. But the idea behind it is that in order to forecast where the world is going, you need to really wash away all the biases that you have. And that's a really difficult thing to do. And very few places will teach you how to do that. Um, and once you do that, once you can kind of forecast where the world is going, indifference to whether that's good or bad, you know, putting passion aside, only then can you, you know, actually figure out, well, how do I change that? 
But if you go into the analysis already biased or already focused on changing the world, you're just going to fail, in my view. And you see this a lot. You see this in politics all the time. You have the zealots, the ideologically committed zealots, who basically come in and say, well, this is how we're going to do it. And they face opposition, because obviously they do. Now, from their own personal self-interest, and many of them won't like, admit this, they're really not trying to change the world. They're just trying to make themselves feel better by kind of washing themselves with their own preconceived biases and, and views. But if you want to change the world, you have to understand the constraints you're operating uh, inside and then try to change those. Um, but that, that starting point of aloof indifference, I think, is most critical in this analysis or really in any endeavor that has to do with you know, human agency. Um, now, <laughs> the reason this is very difficult to acquire is because one, we're humans and we're biased. But the second reason is that, again, the political risk industry is very, very small. So most people who finish international relations or political science or are interested in this, they either go into government, you know, where obviously uh, they don't get trained in nihilism or aloof indifference. <laughs> I mean, it'd be, but I think they should be, you know, uh, but they don't. Or they go and uh, go into kind of the uh, international organization, NGO world, where you definitely don't get instructed on this method, or you go into business or you go into finance, um, where you would think, where you would think that people are instructed in how to think analytically and separate themselves and their own views from their analysis, but they actually don't. And so there's still this kind of indignancy and this kind of a, you know, a judgmental quality, even in finance, to viewing the markets as right or wrong, or what policymakers are doing is stupid, you know, things like that. Then, you know, you, you get faced with this even in finance, where it's like, it's not stupid, it just is. So act accordingly. Um, and I think that it's very difficult to train this. How do you train it? I think the way you train it is you try to use empathy a lot in your analysis. And you try to put yourself in the shoes of those who you even really disagree with. This is really critical to becoming desensitized to yourself and to be able to start looking at concrete data um, and objective facts in forecasting where the world is going. That's where it starts.